Welcome back to the Everything Property Podcast. The last few weeks we've been talking about investing strategies and today's episode is no different. From what started as a backyard idea between a couple of brothers-in-law in 2011 has now transformed into being the leading operator, I believe, uh, in the country. They're averaging 250 builds per year. Mr. Wally Gabriel from Granny Fat Solutions. Welcome to the Everything Property Podcast. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, mate. Look, I'm, I'm really excited for this one. Uh, Granny Flat's a great little investing idea, and I think they're popping up all over the country. But before we, we dive into it, uh, I'm interested to hear you've had a similar background to me, but you were an architectural sort of like draftsman back in the day before starting pre-2011. Is that is that about right? That's about right, yeah. So I started my own business back in year 2000. Yep. Just doing designs for houses, renovations, townhouses, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Also became a builder during that time with no intention of actually building. We just wanted to learn how to build. Yep. So um, that all happened from about year, year 2000 onwards. Um, and as you mentioned before, 2010 yep. is sort of when the idea hit me. Um, and that all stemmed from the state government in 2009 introducing the affordable rental housing policy, which introduced Granny Flats for the first time in New South Wales as a statewide policy. Mm hmm and that was sort of a bit of a trigger thinking, oh, this is interesting. I've always personally liked small spaces, like designing without wastage, I guess, like being practical and efficient design. So for me, it was it was a no-brainer. I thought, I like this. This is awesome. <laughs> small spaces. Ah, so that was that's kind of the trigger that you said, look, hang on, there's, I think there's a business in this as an idea. And then 2011, we were around a dinner table or something. You approach, was it your brothers-in-law, Brother, friends? Yeah, yep. brothers-in-law. So um, my wife's brothers. Yep. One's got um, background in marketing. Uh, sales, customer service, the other in construction. And with my design knowledge, I thought, hey, we've got all the uh, ingredients here. I think yep. this could work. So that's that was the idea that that's where it all started. 2011. And, and what about that? So your first year of business, I think it was like you did something like eight, eight granny right. flats. Eight granny flats, yeah. You just sort of like building, trying to get the word out and stuff like that. Yeah, spot is, on. Is yeah. that sort of how that works? It is. And, you know, we we're doing everything ourselves. We had no staff. It was just, just us. Mm. And, um, it was a relatively new concept at the time. So we were going out approaching real estate agents saying, hey, this is a great idea. You, know, you could double your rent roll, for example. And to them, it was like, oh, no, this, this won't work. It's, you know, nobody wants a granny in their backyard. But in my mind, I was like, no, no, forget granny. Like, this is not just for grannies. It's investment opportunities. Yeah. Um, but again, it was still quite foreign to them. It was still new. So it didn't quite take off straight away. Um, so, yeah, that first year, I only did about eight. Yep. And then that started i think the next year was like something like 40 so sort of wow yeah really started to take off for 2012 13. and do you think that was because of no education no one sort of knew about it everyone was associated with grandmas in backyards i think so yeah but then as people started to build them you sort of gained a bit of interest and people think oh what's this about yeah and i think by then again not just agents but just mum and dads started to think hold on a minute this we could really make some money out of this yeah so people uh, uh are wondering at home or or may not be familiar with the term granny flats what are they how do they work yeah so um the legislation defines it as a secondary dwelling so if you've got a primary dwelling on the property you can build a secondary one mm -hmm. uh, being a granny flat as long as it's got its own facilities so kitchen bathroom bedrooms laundry and so on it's gonna be fully self-contained then that's considered to be a granny flat okay and what, what about the sizing so the state policy allows you to be up to 60 square meters so that's like a two-bedroom unit, a kitchen, living, dining, and so on. And that's sort of the statewide policy. Statewide policy, 60 square metres on the block size of? A uh, minimum of 450 square metres with Perfect. a 12-metre wide frontage. Okay. And some pros of building, some pros and some reasons people would build a granny flat is, is essentially cash flow. What, what do you see majority of your clients? Are they investors? Are they big families? or? Yeah, it's sort of a big mix. Um, investors are a big really big market. Mm -hmm. Again, they're, a lot of investors are all money-driven. They don't want to see numbers. They invest this much, what's my return? Mm -hmm. So for them, it's a no-brainer. And uh, But the other yeah, the other side of that, our other larger portion of our business is, is mum, uh, sorry, large families. You know, the kids can't afford to move out or buy a house or rent. So you know, injecting that money back into your property, number one, is going to add value to it. But at the same time, you're providing accommodation for the family. And are the parents kicking the kids out to the granny flat or is the kids kicking the parents it's out? It's interesting the... because initially it was, you know, putting the kids in the back. But honestly, I've seen a trend lately where <laughs> because they're new and because we, we custom design them and they could pick anything they want. Yeah. We've seen the parents fall in love with it thinking, you know, what, well, we don't need all this space anymore. Mm -hmm. So we'll let the kids have the main house. You know, that, particularly 
you know, the kids are probably growing families and so on. So we'll, that's enough space for us and they're yep. living in the granny flat. So I've seen a bit of a shift towards that recently. Actually. Oh my God, how <laughs> funny. Okay, so how does how does it sort of work if, if people are thinking about it at home? I think maybe we can touch on the difference between DA and CDC because a lot of these majority, if not, Maybe all of them are through CDC that you guys are doing. You're doing any DAs? Yeah, yeah, we are. Oh, so, you are? Yeah, absolutely. So CDC is the most common, the easiest, quickest form of approval. Mm-hmm. It's more like a checklist. I mentioned before the state policy. It's like a checklist. If we meet the minimum lot sizes, widths, landscaping ratios, heights, setbacks, and so on, mm-hmm. then you know, a certifier within 14 days can approve that. Pretty straightforward. Even when a certifier approves the structure, they still notify council. So it's not... You know, people get nervous about the idea of a certifier thinking it's foreign or it's you know not done properly throughout council, but they're just almost acting on behalf of council. So council's still notified about it. Now, when you can't meet the requirements of that checklist, so mm-hmm. for example, your block size might be a touch too small or you just don't meet that minimum. Like a setback or something like yeah, that? Yeah, exactly. So the certifier doesn't have the discretion to say, oh, it's close enough, I'll let it go. That certifier's got to approve, they tick every single box mm-hmm. to do a CDC. Otherwise, we then go through council and do a DA. Interesting. And... In, in th- you said that uh, a certifier can approve it within two weeks. What about the design? So say if I come to you with a block of land and I'll, I want to get you guys out to review, see that, you know, if I can put a granny flat on it, you guys will obviously tell me yes, no, maybe, whatever. What's the time it takes to sort of put this sort of documentation together for a granny flat? Typically, it's about six to eight weeks. Yep. That's before we can get an approval. The reason for that is um, even though there's no council approval as such, we've still got to prepare all the documentation. So I still need surveyors on site, it's architects to draw the plans up, mm-hmm. uh, engineers, structural storm, we need Sydney water approval, basics yep. requirements, all those things. So that takes about six or so weeks, depending yep. on the complexity of the site, and then roughly about two weeks to to get an approval. Get it, get it approved to with the certify tick of approval, then you can start building straight away off those plans. You don't need a construction certificate or anything like that? No, the only thing that um, once it's approved, we order the homeowner's warranty insurance. Mm-hmm which is typical of any building, and then we're starting on site within a few weeks of the approval. And you guys order that, or does the client need to? No, we do that. So as the builder, we have to, it's mandatory, we have to provide that insurance for every project. Perfect. And then talk to me about time frame. If if these things are only 60 square metres, they're obviously a lot smaller than house and land packages and stuff like that. Um, what is the, what's the general breakdown of the, of the building process, like per week, you know, is it, What's the build timeline and what are you doing sort of each week? Yeah, sure. A typical project could take about 16 to 18 weeks. Now, prior to COVID, Mm -hmm. it was close to about 10 to 12 weeks. Really? Back then when there were no shortage of materials or labor or anything, it was a lot quicker. Um, There was an abundance of everything. Then when COVID hit, it slowed things right down. Mm -hmm. I have to say it's starting to... A flat line a bit now, so mm-hmm. it's not as bad as it was. A few is that ago. is that with prices or just de- demand and getting like timings? What, how have you probably seen that? A bit of both. Yep. So with um, costs, probably aware during COVID, everything just skyrocketed, mm. and it was um, it was very fluid. So you know, we signed a contract, and then a week later something had changed, and we were locked in. So mm. pricing just kept climbing, and there was nothing we could do about that. These days, it's sort of like I said, sort of equalized a bit. So we sort of know our pricing. Even the suppliers and trades are coming to us and saying, look, we'll fix these price now for another 12 months. Like they've got the confidence as well. Wow. So pe- so suppliers are starting to say that already? We've had a few of them, yeah. Yep. And we've seen, like we've still seen an increase, but it's been maybe 1%, 1.5%, depending, you know, some trades are more than others, but it's nothing like it was a few years ago. Building building through like 2021, uh, 2019, 2021, when it was that, how, like, was that a really difficult time for the business, or how did you, how did you go? Because a lot of a lot of builders went bankrupt, and are still going bankrupt and bust. Absolutely, honestly, that was probably the toughest time in the history of the company. Yeah, um, wow. There were so many factors, but one of the biggest ones was, if you remember the LGA lockdowns. Yep. And that's where people just couldn't travel to work. <laughs> so that alone, just even just that alone, was enough to stop a lot of projects. Oh. And then whilst that project is stopped pricing was still going up. Yep. So, you know, it would sit there still for eight weeks or whatever the case may be. Then you come back to do it. And, you know, that trade wants this much, this trade wants that much. And it just, yeah, it was almost like we just got to do what we got to do to get the projects going. And were, you, were you taking on new a lot of new work then or if it's kind of just like, look, let's finish what's on our books? Yeah. We were still getting inquiries. Yep. We were still doing the whole pre-construction process. So we're still taking on the designs and getting the plans approved. But we didn't want to let people down, so we didn't want to start any new projects until we'd gotten through a majority of the older projects mm. and really understood the costs and what it actually meant because 
yeah, like it was, it was, it was a huge hit. Challenging. But I'm, well, yeah, my partners, we're very, I wouldn't say proud, but not the type of person I'd want to shut down the business because it was easier to do because mm. we could have. And, you know, the media was all over, you know, builders going bust and so on. So we could have, but I just couldn't do it. It's not in me to sort of leave people high and dry. So yeah. it was a case of, you know, our business modeling at the time, business plans were just batting down the hatches and let's just get through this, you know. Yeah. Well, like let's full... not spend anywhere. Let's just focus on the business. Let's get through this. And yeah. It's the best thing we ever did. Full credit to you because, as you said, yeah, a lot of people chucked in the towel. So I think any builders that came out of that and have went on to, to now be stronger is like, yeah, they really went through the tough. Like, I don't know when the the next ride like that's going to be, but like yeah. if you can weather that storm, you can weather – you know, a lot of other things yeah. going wrong. Like you had materials, you had the shutdown, so you had staff issues. Like yeah. you had everything in the book thrown at every build art. Yeah. I don't know if like too many people outside the industry realise how challenging that would have been, but yeah. you sort of came out the other side, right? Yep, no, definitely. So quite so, proud of that. So 14 to 16 weeks, you're getting these things built. On top of that, the time frame for approvals and documentation is we said for about six to eight weeks roughly six to eight weeks so we're at uh 24 26 weeks yep give or take so yeah I, like i typically say it's about a six month process, process. yeah because even in that pro even in that time frame design mm -hmm. approval we have clients come into our showrooms to select all their colors and materials yep and because everything we do is very much customized we'll often get requests for something that's not in our showroom so we've got to go out there and source that product and yep. get it quoted and so on so sometimes it might take a little bit longer but that's sort of the average time frame. So you guys aren't like a copy and paste home builder. You guys provide, I think you, you do have some off the plan, ready to go options, but you can also custom design pretty much anything, right? Yeah, spot on. W what are some of the wild wild and wacky things you've built in people's backyards? Like I'm sure you've built some monstrosity granny flats with really <laughs> good finishes. Is there anything like that that you've done that you've went, wow, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting build? Yeah. Um, quite a few actually, but the one that comes to mind now was a project we did in Dural probably six or seven years ago because yep. uh, it's acreage and the requirements are a lot more relaxed than they are in the suburban areas in the sense of how much you can build on, on acreage. We built a 60 square meter granny flat with a four car garage attached to it. And no joke, the garage was actually larger than the granny flat itself. <laughs> and then this <laughs> massive wraparound deck and it looks absolutely stunning. Like you can imagine on a rural property and mm. the outlook, it was just absolutely gorgeous. But um, it's very different. <laughs> you take an opportunity to do that you know, very often. Is that is that still classified as like a, a granny flat under CDC then? Uh, it was cl it's classified as a granny flat, yeah, but yep. that was done through DA. Okay, because of the size of the because garage. The size, yeah, because it's rural as well. You can't do CDC in, in rural areas. That's uh, that's full on. Is there any horror stories that you've seen or you've had to deal with? Or um, We had one project, I think, was in Eastwood, Epic, somewhere around there. Yep. A few, uh, few years back now as well. Where we started excavating the site and... We just found so much crap <laughs> buried in the ground. Oh. And the owner had just purchased it. They had no idea. Yep. It was quite a sloping site. So it looks like whoever owned it before had done a bit of, you know, Phil. leveling, excavation, yeah. field call or whatever. And yep. um, so we just dug this massive hole in the ground because we couldn't just go build on top of that. We didn't know it was how compact is it. You know, it's yep. going to hold up the building. So it was just constantly trucks coming in and out. It was like a mining site. Was it? Know? What was it, like asbestos and stuff? Or? Um, no, just buried bricks and... Um, it's almost really? like an old structure. Almost a house was just buried underneath <laughs> it. But truly, it was that deep. Yeah. And even the neighbor next door doesn't remember it. So it could have been quite old, but yeah. Wow. That was, so we were on site for, I think it was like almost two months just getting the site ready to start building. Whereas in two months, we should be close to finishing. So, <laughs> well, yeah, finished, but it's, so. it's one of those things where you don't know until yeah, you start digging. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of interesting finds uh, underground. It could have been worse. Like you could have had a artifact or something yeah, like that right, and, and yeah. that, all that, that kind of stuff. Thing. Just quickly, for, for the CDC, for the granny fat, what type of a consultants are involved in that? Who do, who do you essentially need to work on that? What, what are the consultants? Yeah. So um, the first thing is a registered surveyor and we make sure we only use registered surveyors. That's quite important. All the plans we do in-house. So we've got a team of eight designers. So when a project comes through, they do all the design, all the pre-construction type uh, work. Yep. We use a basics consultant for energy efficiency, stormwater engineer, structural engineer, Sydney water approval, like a tap in, and then private certifier. Perfect. That's it. Just the five and then straight yeah, the into the main it. ones. I mean, every now and then we might come across um, maybe an acoustic engineer or a flood engineer, so the property is flood affected, or a bushfire engineer, arborist. Mm -hmm. 
So depending on the actual project itself, and that's why before I mentioned a six to eight week process for design approval, it does depend so much on the site itself, any constraints. Like if it is, for example, bushfire affected, you can still build under CDC. You can? You can. There are certain okay. levels. So you can get up to about 29. Yep. So that determines that the the um, yeah, how high of a, of a rating it is. If it's up to 29, you can still go through CDC, but then we need to get, engage a bushfire consultant to prepare a report. So that itself could take two weeks to do. And then over Bell 29, you go on, it has to be DA? It has to be DA, and then councils are pretty strict about building a Bell what, what are some other things that would qualify a site, uh, that would disqualify a site? Is it you build on any slopes and yeah, anything like that? That's fine. Okay. Slopes are okay. Again, it just means more investigation. So geotech engineers, we do landslip reports, make sure you know, if it is on a, on a steep angle, which we've done quite a few of, we just want to know what's beneath, what's beneath the ground, how are we anchoring our footings and things like that. So we've got engineers involved. But um, sometimes we're confronted with things like conservation areas, in which case you have to go through DA. I mentioned bushfire before, if it's a higher rating. With flood affected sites, again, there's low, medium and high risk areas. If it's low or medium, you can potentially still do a CDC. If it's a high, it has to go through DA. Other things, they're probably the most common ones. And what trees, do, trees are actually really big things. Yeah, do you want to, a good valid point, do you want to talk us through TPZs? Okay, yeah. So the code is has changed, it's evolved quite a bit. You know, once upon a time, it was very vague. It just mentioned if a tree was below six meters, you could remove it if it was within, you know, if it was close to where you're building or within three meters of where you're building. But it has changed and the definitions have changed and so on. So now we need to identify what type of tree it is and if it's protected or not. So it could be a small tree, but if it's protected in that particular council area, then we still need council approval to have the tree removed. Tree protection zones, a TPZ, so it um, tells us or stipulates how we're going to do our footings within that radius of the tree. Typically, you're allowed to encroach about 10% of that tree protection zone. The TPZ is determined by the... The word for the... The, the canopy of the tree. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. What about what about um, a lot of what runs through a lot of backyards is sewer? Yep. Encasements and stuff like that. Can you build a granny flat over them? Do you need to re-divert it? What's the go there? Yep. So um, a main sewer won't stop you from building, mm -hmm. but you'll have to go through a Sydney water approval process and then you have to potentially encase the sewer. So if you're getting within about 90 centimetres of a sewer, a main sewer line, you may need to encase the sewer or, and build deeper piers. And the whole idea of that is that it's... Um, what does encasing mean for, for if I'm listening to this? I don't know what it means. Yeah, sure. So encasing basically means we're going to dig that whole trench around the sewer, expose it, and put concrete about 60 centimetres wide all the way around top, bottom, side. And the idea there is that, you know, you go ahead and place a building on top of that. The weight of the building is not going to affect or put pressure on the sewer because it's now encased in concrete. Mm -hmm. And that protect that uh, part of the asset is now effect, uh, is, uh, protected for life. Um, so if Sydney Water needs to do any maintenance in their future, They'd never have to touch that portion of pipe because it's been encased, it's protected. Yep. Whereas they might have to go upstream or downstream where it's exposed and you know, dig it out there and work on it if they had to. Can you go, uh, if you're encasing a sewer, can you do still do it under CDC? Or does that then make it a DA? Yeah, they can still go through CDC. So the Sydney Water Approval doesn't affect whether it's DA or CDC. And in fact, councils aren't even involved in the Sydney Water Approval process. So it's a completely different approval process. Just going to make sure count, um, Sydney Water's fast and not... Uh Slow like council sometimes. Yeah, look, they're not too bad. If it's yeah. a straight uh, standard sewer encasement, what I mean by standards, you know, typical residential lots, it's going to be pretty straightforward, pretty quick. Okay, so we've talked about um, the size of the sites. We've talked about some things that would disqualify them. We've talked about time frames and the approval process. The question that's going to be on everyone's lips is, how much are people building granny flats for these days? What does it cost? What does it cost? What does the approval part cost? And what is, where does the construction sort of sit? post COVID material prices and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So our starting price now in Sydney is at 135000 and that actually includes all the design and approvals as well. Wow. Yeah, so it's not as bad as people might think. Only one thirty. Yeah, 135000 in Sydney. Jeez, that's, that's value for money. Yeah, but again, it depends. So then the next step after that is to validate the site and see what's, you know, is it sloping? Is there a sewer? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what else are we dealing with? If it's sloping a lot, do we need to bring in fuel? Are we excavating? Are we building retaining walls? Yes. All those things. So that could start to add up as well. Okay, because it's going to caveat what you said is that 130 would be, I'd assume, a flat block with side access that's really easy to build on. Absolutely. Okay. And one thing that um, people, some people don't quite understand is mm. if I've got a vacant block of land, it's mm. so easy to build. But we're building on backyards where there's an established house. You've got a one-meter site setback. 
we need to bring in machines to excavate all those types so we really need to remove soil it's not that easy so all of that sort of comes under what we call site costs which we know what it costs us to build the granny flat mm-hmm. and these are the additional things that that particular site we have to factor in for access access that's a big one uh, people are you know removing pools as well mm-hmm. um, again you need good access to do that otherwise you've got a tiny machine there oh. a little jackhammer d- 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 you know just hammering away that could take weeks to get it the size to fit it down the side of the house to just to break it all up and take it in pieces and again you're taking it in small pieces it's not um can't drive a truck to the backyard so they're the type of things that we have to look at every time we go evaluate a site mm-hmm. so yeah the 135 as you said before is based on a flat side flat side easy access nothing no major hurdles and it's possible it can be done on okay. those sites and then customization stuff Starts to add to the price too. Potentially. But like we've got 60 square meters to play with. So customizing doesn't always add a lot more cost. Mm -hmm. You're still going to end up with two bedrooms and a bathroom and laundry. Where the cost may start to escalate is if you want to upgrade a lot of items. Like for example, your kitchen. You know, if you want to add islands or breakfast bars and pendant lights and things like that, which look absolutely stunning. But those sort of things are sort of start to add on to the base cost. What else would add on to the sites site establishment costs and stuff is there anything else that are big that people sort of don't think about no, that would that yeah. would add it on it's, it's just access you think uh, access is a big one um services so again yep. we spoke about sewer before stormwater is another really really big one a lot of blocks slope towards the rear when you try to get water uphill to the mm-hmm. street in some cases there may be a drainage easement in the backyard which is, is a bonus because if particularly if it's sloping downhill we can just tap straight into that okay that's probably the best form in cases where we can't or it doesn't exist, we might have to try to look at charge system up the hill. Yeah. But if it's sloping a lot towards the back, the charge line won't work. So we're looking at absorption pit, uh, sorry, absorption pits or infiltration trenches, things like that. So interesting. The type of things that we've got to consider as well, and also like we've got to connect your water, your sewer, uh, electricity, NBN, all those types of things. So we're when we're on site looking, we're trying to figure out where we're going to run all those services. You know, sometimes you might have the meter box at the front left-hand side of the block. Mm. And we're building the bottom left-hand side, uh, right-hand yeah, side. Back so right, we're yeah. trying to find a way to get to there in the least destructive way. We don't want to be breaking concrete everywhere because it's just going to add a lot of cost. Mm. So we're trying to find ways of um, keeping it cost-effective for the client. Services is a really good one because I think a lot of people overlook that. I, you, even you're talking about that, I thought, yeah, look, if you do go to like a majority concrete backyard, but I, I mean, I'm sure you guys would have 101 solutions um, to all that kind of stuff. Okay. And you guys run a few, a couple of packages as well for the internals and what's included and what's not included, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we have our, um, you mentioned before about designs as well. We've got some, like an investor range, yeah, which a lot of investors love because for them, the design's already done. If we can show that it fits on their block, they'll pick that design. We can modify it if we need to, but it's sort of, they're saving a lot of time. That six to eight week process could get cut down quite significantly. So that's actual design. But when it comes to internal packages, yes, yeah, so we have internal, we've got different um, um, even schemes like a like different mood boards. Okay. So we're Hampton style. Cold, dark, conk. Absolutely. Uh, but if people don't like that, we've also got our own interior designer. So I think 90% of our customers come through, meet our interior designer and just customize it. So they don't have to pick a color scheme. They can mm-hmm. say, I really want a red door and I want, blue kitchen well that's okay if that's what you want we can do it so they'll just pick the color scheme they like and yep. we'll make it happen yeah um, dingham that easy yeah it is we all right we've got well we've got price and stuff i guess i guess um all i want to sort of know now is there's you guys have been doing this for a long time so you know the ins and outs and you know all the rules and not the loopholes but you know probably things and ideas that that people don't know. There's some things around that I've uh, that I've got from your presentations, um, having sat in them over the years. One of them is that uh, you can build bigger than 60 square meters. Not a lot of people know about that one. You want to talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so that um, applies probably more to rural areas. Mm-hmm. I'll give you two examples, and it's just probably based on where we are geographically and a lot of the councils we deal with. Hornsby Council allows you to build up to 120 square meters. Wow, and it's classed as a area. granny flat. Still classified as a granny flat in a wow. rural area. There's so a couple of grannies fitting in there. <laughs> so like our typical ones are what, 60 square meters with two bedrooms. We've done four bedroom, two bathroom granny flats and then still added a garage to that as well and a veranda or whatever the case may be. So that's um, that's that's Hornsby Council. Is that garage counted in the 120? If it's attached, it would be. If yep. it's detached, it's not. Okay. Uh, that's in Hornsby. Whereas otherwise typically... Garage is always excluded, even when you do a CDC, for example, 
you can attach a garage, you can attach a deck, they're all excluded from your 60 square meters. Perfect. It's just great. internal square meters then? Yep. Nice. Uh, Hillshire Council allow you a percentage of the size of the existing house. So, true story, we're actually designing one at the moment, which is 400 and something square meters. No joke, the house is absolutely huge. The house is 400 so square no, meters? No, the granny flat's going to be 400 square meters. The house is like 1,000 or something square meters. Oh. No joke. What? We actually went to council to say, before we go too far, is this permissible? And it is. Their code is very, it's black and white. It says you can build up to, I'm sorry, don't, I think it's 25% of the size of the house. Yep. Or there's a certain percentage. Tw- yeah, twenty. I think 20% for hills. Yep. yep. But so, Hornsby's yeah. 33. Yeah. yeah. So we're- 400 square, square meters. It's massive. It's a house. Okay. It's a house. So that that's a, I mean, that's bigger than some houses. <laughs> that is bigger than, most yeah, m- most houses. 400 square meter house. Jesus. Yeah. Um, and what about if my site is smaller than 450 square meters? Now, I think I'll put a bit of a caveat on this is that just because you're over 40, 450 square meters doesn't mean it's actually right to put the granny flat in there because setbacks and like depending where your house sits on the block, like I, I've seen some examples where it's almost as if like you you're off each side fence like yeah. 950 the E's are over 450 so you don't have a lot of room there so but what if my blocks under 450 square meters and I've got room in the backyard for something can I do it that way so the way to do that so mm-hmm. the answer is yes you can yep. the um, code actually says that if your block is under 450 square meters you can still build a granny flat under CDC as long as it's part of or under the existing roof of the main house so the best way to explain that is if I had an existing house and I wanted to convert that back section of it into a granny flat, mm-hmm. because it's existing, I can convert that section of the house into a granny flat because okay. it's an existing part of the house. Yep. In which case the block width and block area are no longer applicable. So it doesn't matter. You could have a 300 square meter block of land with an existing house on it and you decide I want to convert that back, those back two rooms into a granny flat, for example. Yep, self Still can't exceed 60 square meters. It has to be maximum 60. But then you put an application in to convert that section and then they don't look at the, um, as I mentioned before, they don't look at your block size, your block width. Okay, so a way around that with doing, uh, I'm just trying to think, uh, a way around it, if you don't have the roof space, if you don't have the floor space, is there a way you can extend your roof somehow and then come back and do the granny flat after, like an old St. Nads? Could you do it that way? Yeah, absolutely. So, because we build houses as well, we've done a few houses where we've, designed it in a way where we knew it was under 450 square meters mm. we knew that they were going to eventually convert that back section of the house to a granny flat so it was all designed that way so that you know the back section of the house was a rumpus room with a bedroom and a little wet bath mm. and a bathroom so we knew the overall or the end result yeah but it went through got the house approved so with a house you only have to have 200 square meters to do a cdc so we got the house approved and then after it was approved completed got the occupation certificate we relodge an application to convert that section into a grand flat because, again, it was now an existing part of the house oh. it was under the existing roof and therefore it was applicable. So, very so clever. Get around it. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. And can you get what's the difference between a studio and a granny flat? Because I've seen blocks go up for sale with a granny flat and a studio. Yep. So, when can I put that on? What What is one? When can I put one on? And I think that'll segue into your uh, opening event that, that happened uh, last weekend. But what's yep. what's the what's the difference between those two? So Granny Flat is a habitable structure. It's got bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, everything else. A studio can, is it, it's sort of ancillary to the main dwelling. So I could build a little studio at the back where you know, I might want an art studio or whatever the case may be, but we can't have any cooking facilities in there. So no kitchen and no laundry. Okay. So I could have a bathroom in there. It could be a workshop, could be a, again, art studio, dance studio, whatever can you, you want Can you have a be. sink? You can have a sink. So you have a wet bar, yeah, but it can't. It can't be a kitchen. What do you mean it can't? Like, <laughs> well, we're not allowed. Okay, to, if this we is, we won't put in any facilities for that. But okay, you're allowed to get a. So again, if you, again, I always use the example of an art studio. If you're there painting yeah. and you want to wash your paintbrushes and your tins, you're allowed to have a sink in there for that purpose. You can have a full bathroom in there. Bedrooms. It's a very grey area. Once upon a time, it was okay. Councils are a little cracking down on that now a bit more because they're thinking, well, somebody can sleep in there. It's now habitable. So they're, yeah, okay. they're starting to get a little bit, um, yeah, they're cracking down on that a bit. So you maximum size of a studio is 36 square meters. Mm-hmm. 
So compare that like six by six garage, roughly yeah, a double not garage. Bad. Not bad. Not little that. size, yeah. It typically be open plan. Have a bathroom in there, little small kitchenette for uh, with a sink, but no cooking or laundry facilities, and then that's permissible. And that's permissible on with the same rules as long as the block size over four fifty square uh, meters. No, so um, the setbacks are more like nine hundred or one point five meters from the rear or side, depending on your block width. Yeah, nothing. Whereas a granny flat's typically three meters from the rear boundary plus. So. We've done a lot where the granny flat was set back three meters, then the studio, which is detached, was set back only one meter, or 900 or 1.5 meters, depending on the block width. You can build them both, so you get two separate applications, build them at the same time, there's no issue with that. Uh, but you can't legally occupy that studio. Yeah, okay, you can't for, get it. For living or for renting out for separate purposes, but if it's for home use or rec- recreation or whatever, that's that's permissible. Interesting, yeah. that's really that's really good to know. And I guess it, it leads into um, sort of next topic of conversation. I, I'm, I'm I'm probably fully fully covered and across granny flats. Um, how long they take to build, design the build, the cost, ways we can get around and stuff like that. You guys just launched uh, granny flat solutions. You just launched a a version of the tiny home. Talk to me. Talk to me about that. How that comes about and and what is it? All right. So that idea probably started a few years ago, probably during COVID. Just seeing a need for accommodation probably the big one, and affordable housing. That's been a buzzword for for many, many years Mm. now with councils and politicians and whatnot. But just seeing a need for more accommodation and knowing that we're limited with our granny flats because we can't reach, at the moment, our business doesn't reach outside of sort of Sydney, Central Coast, Newcastle, and down to Wollongong and so on. But all those regional areas, we just can't reach them. And knowing that there were a lot of people, even in Sydney, who just couldn't build a granny flat because their block was affected by flooding or bushfire, whatever it is, we just saw this as an awesome opportunity where we could still build these little houses, mm-hmm. um, but once you put them on a trailer, put it on wheels, it's no longer classified as a structure or a building. It's actually a vehicle. Okay. So we're now bound. So if we build these little tiny homes on wheels, we're governed by a width of two, no more than 2.5 meters, no more than 4.3 meters high, and no more than four and a half tons. Okay. And if we stick to those, ru- those rules, we're allowed to drive it on the road, it's like a caravan essentially, and you can park it anywhere you want. So, I always use the example. And there's, you know, obviously there are road rules where you can park your vehicle, so you'll be governed by those. But nobody, when you drive into your property, nobody tells you you have to park your car one meter off the fence. Yeah. So you could drive this in and park it pretty much anywhere you want. And because it's considered a vehicle, councils still have no jurisdiction over that, and they can't stop it. Wow. And um, so that's a bit of a loophole there. Yeah. But it's it's allowing not just us, but I guess it's allowing people in rural areas or regional areas who can't build a granny flat for whatever reason to be able to provide accommodation. And with these, they can be hook them on the back of a truck and they can be delivered anywhere. So it's just another form of accommodation. What's the, what is the price and the size of those sort of start and range at? Yep, so they're not cheaper than granny flats. Mm. They're probably somewhat comparable, in some cases a bit more expensive. Um, so we don't. They're not. They're not competing with granny flats. It's just a very different type of structure. Yeah. Uh, for those areas where you can't, but the the ones that we built recently started about six meters long, six meters long, mm-hmm. by two point five wide, and that's about one hundred and thirty thousand. And then they range up to about nine and a half, ten meter long trailers, which wow. can be close to about you know uh, one hundred and seventy something thousand. My question would be thinking about through them, and I, I see them all the time on sort of like um, social media. What what happens with services most importantly like i'm thinking toilet shower and then power yep so when they're built they're built with the provision so you can run a 15 amp lead into it and that yep. powers up your whole building wow and that's more than enough given what it is that's more than enough power uh water you connect the garden hose yep it's literally that easy like literally click on the garden hose yeah well wow. it's got a connection for it. you plug it in and that's it got a valve on it so yep. you turn it on and water comes in sewer so there are a few options with sewer Depending on where you're located, if it's close enough to like the main sewer or even a junction on the property, you can get a licensed plumber to come in and do a proper connection. If you're in rural areas, sept, uh, pardon me, compost toilets are probably the way to go. So the compost toilets are like a little unit that sits underneath it or beside it. And um, it just cleans. So every time you go to a toilet, like those portal loos you see on construction sites, sort mm-hmm. of that model where um, it's like a bacteria in it. It sort of keeps it clean. And the cartridges get changed every now and then. So they're not relying on any connections to a sewer main. So even when you connect that sewer uh, to, say, the, the main, that then doesn't council, you don't need council approval for that. Council still don't know about it because it's technically still a vehicle? It's 
correct, and it's Sydney Water, not Council. Wow. I mentioned okay. before about I talked before about uh, yeah. sewer services. They're not they're not governed by council at all. Now the right thing to do is you can go on Sydney Water's website. It's a thing called a tap in approval. Mm-hmm. So you just show the location of your sewer on the property where you want to place your structure, your tiny home in this instance, and it'll tell you if you're too close to the sewer or not. Ideally, you'd want to do that quick check first to make sure that you're not placing it close to the main sewer, in which case you're protected. But you could also go park it right on top. But if you know Sydney would need to access that asset for whatever reason, they're going to ask you to move, move the home. And then you've got people that add rainwater tanks and grey water tanks as well. So yep. rainwater collects all your roof water that can be used for gardens and whatnot, or it can be reused in toilets. The grey water systems are designed for picking up all your, you know, your your sinks, shower, laundry, so all the dirtier water. That goes into those tanks, so they just connect to the side of it, and that could also be filtered and used for gardens and so on. Okay. Does every granny flat, uh, any every built granny flat on 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 ground, does that need to have a um, a water tank these days with basic requirements or? Don't always have to. Yep. So some councils don't um, don't make it mandatory. Some okay. councils do, and that also comes down to basics. So basics will tell us how many. Well, we work out how many liters. How much roof area has been collected, and that yep. will tell us whether we need a rainwater tank or not. But typically, most of them do, but not all of them. Okay, very interesting. Sort of to to finish and wrap up. Do you have any sort of golden nuggets or anything you want to share with the audience around th- people that are maybe thinking about a granny flat, um, what they can look at, or you know what they should know? Anything from your time and experience in the field? Without being biased, I think it's really important to get the right builder. There's been a lot of horror stories. Everybody thinks because it's a small building, it's easy to build. In some ways, it might be easier to build because it's smaller, but there are so many things that need to be considered. Um, you need somebody who's built them, knows what to look for on site. Uh, again, it's very different to a brand new build where you come on, block, the block is vacant, you can put anything anywhere you want. Mm. With granny flats, you're people are typically living on a construction site. So if you have an investor, if it's an investment property and you have tenants in the front, they're going to be living on a construction site. So it's so important that the builder knows what they're doing, knows how to fence off the site. Um, that's just one example. But yeah, just got to look for a company. To me, I feel it's important that you work with a builder who knows what they're doing, is experienced. Yep. We've won lots of awards, so we know what we're doing. We know what to look out for. Yep. Um, and yeah, that, to me, that's probably the important thing. Just uh, just quickly to, to, touch, that, to touch on that, um, how many of these builds are you doing? Because like, for investors at the moment, for example, that have a that have a property and they're thinking that they can fit a granny flat in the backyard, are, are you doing that? How many of those are, are you doing? Are you doing it with an empty front house or some of some of the work that you're doing? Is there tenants and people in that front thing? Oh, you know, are you fencing it off? Are you putting color bond? Like, how does that go? Because that's that's going to be a there's a bit of a negotiation there with sound and construction Absolutely. noise and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So. I don't know the exact statistics, but I reckon it's 85 or 90%, if not more, of the projects we do. We do, there's somebody living in the front. Yep. Um, so what we do before we start the project, we have a meeting on site with the tenants and we make them very aware of, like with, with, we're negotiating with them. We're saying, is where we're coming from, are you okay with this? We'll put up a temporary fence. We're sort of working with them. Yep. We know they're going to be inconvenienced. In some cases, not always. So we want to make sure if they want access from this side, well, we'll put our fencing around here. Sometimes we'll put shade cloth. If they've got dogs, we might have to put you know, the, the lower barriers to stop them coming through. So, yeah, a lot of times we're working with somebody living in the main wow. house. If it's an owner, they're usually a bit easier. We still have to, for oh we still have to block off the construction site and have gates and things like that. But we're also trying to navigate deliveries of materials. You know, when you're building a grain flat, you've got 5,000 bricks. Yeah. That's not one little pallet. That's 20 pallets. Yeah. So you've got to find somewhere to put that. So if you've got a tenant living in the front, and they want to use the driveway. We need the driveway. They're the type of negotiations that are happening um, from day one. Yeah. And sometimes even throughout the building process. Do many of them ask, uh, I don't know if you know this, but do many of them ask for like subsidized rent from the owner? Yeah, some do. Is, is that a common thing? Some do. But the investor would often look at that and say, yeah, look, I might lose a little bit of money for the next three months. But they know that when that granny flat's rented out, Printing money. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a good win. Perfect. Wally, last question to summarize and finish up. What's a quote you live your life by? Oh, okay. Um, I've got a few, but... Give me. One is you've got to slow down to speed up. I always find that when we rush, we make rash decisions, and sometimes they're not the right decisions. So, I always like to 
and you know, the nature of my business is I'm making decisions all day, every day. Sometimes they're the wrong ones, but when I have the opportunity to, I just want to slow down, think about it, make the right decisions. And I often find that when we, um, yeah, I often find I'd make better decisions when I'm not not stressed. No, that's so good. When, that's probably one of my favorites, and, and I share that with everyone in the office as well. Sometimes you've got to slow down and speed up. Yeah. Perfect. Well, look, Wally Gabriel, thank you so much from Granny Flat Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us on the Everything Property Podcast. I appreciate you coming out and um, I'll leave your details in the show notes should anyone want to reach out and they're thinking about having a Granny Flat. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. All good. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.